Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So today is a highly relevant talk at the quorum as we learn the true impact that COVID-19 is having on organizations. We need to adapt to the new normal, change tactics and thought processes to tackle the fallout. I believe it's fair to assume that the virus is here to stay for a while and hence organizations too will need to build immunity to survive and perhaps thrive. Our panel today comprises some of the leading minds best suited to comment on the matter at hand, owing to their extensive research and expertise of the subject. The immune organization has been authored by our very own Q member and tech leader, Mr. Jaspreet Bindra. Jaspreet is a thought leader in digital transformation and is also the co-founder of Digital Matters and UnQ, and his first book was The Tech Whisperer. Joining Jaspreet at the quorum with all the much needed insight is one of the leading epidemiologists, Professor Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan, founder and director of the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy in Washington, DC, and a senior research scholar and lecturer at Princeton University. Also dialing in remotely to moderate today's conversation is Mr. Vikram Chandra, veteran journalist, news anchor, and the founder of Editor G. I welcome you all who are physically with us at the club and those who are tuning in online. Before I hand over the conversation to you, just wanted to reiterate that we will have a Q&A session post the conversation and everyone who's tuning in online, you can send us your questions directly through our streaming platform that has been powered by BeLive. All right, gentlemen, over to you, please. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, just speak, uh, Professor. Great, great to have you with us as well. I mean, look how much the world is changing. Who would have thought we'd have done something like this, right? I see the two of you sufficiently socially distanced from each other. Um, just please, we may have to pull off that mask and slide it a little bit to make sure we can hear you. But, and I'm in a different location, and then the quorum is across, is, is somewhere in, in, in the distance behind us. It just illustrates and shows how much things have changed in. What's it? This has been only 100 days, 120 days. 120 days, if you had said we are doing something like this, you wouldn't have believed it. People wouldn't have believed it. If you had told me 100 days ago that organizations like mine went overnight from 60 people sitting in an office to everyone working from home and no one has seen each other's face in 100 days and it's somehow working, I wouldn't have believed you. But that and so much more has happened. So what should organizations do? What should countries do? What should societies do? And just what are we headed for? Uh, those are some of the subjects that, that we're going to try and talk about and including uh, just specifically from you from an organization point of view how do you build an immune organization that's one of the lessons we're going to try and get from you but before i come to you and the book and try and figure out the immune organization i think everyone really wants to know um professor Lakshmi Narayan, a million cases right now right i mean a hundred I, I remember a hundred days ago or thereabouts when we were trying to debate just how bad this is going to get um a million cases seemed very far away. And I'm not sure whether this is the worst case uh, the estimate that people had or the best case people had, or was this within the realm of, of possibility? How do you judge where we are in India specifically at a million cases, doing better than expected, worse than expected? And how bad do you think it's going to get going forward? Uh, thanks, Vikram, and, and thanks for that introduction. So. Uh, in early March, I think uh, you know our predictions were that by the end of July, we would have upwards of 200 million cases, infections, if nothing were to happen. So this is if the baseline scenario, because it's very easy to predict how viruses evolve. It's very hard to predict how human beings respond to the virus. We could not have predicted the lockdown in March. We could not have predicted that the government would have taken it that seriously, but they did. and. Uh, and at that time, this was, this was the prediction based on how the virus would go. Now, today, we have a million reported cases. The actual cases, infections to date are probably closer to 100 million because uh, we only you know, pick up about one in every 100 cases that are out there because India is still one of the lowest testing countries in the world. We are on the rank of countries for testing. We are 138th in rank of testing. So we have far more infections out there than the reported infections actually give you uh, a picture on. And that's both good and bad news. The good news is that even if we're understating deaths maybe by a factor of four or five, which is my guess, 
uh, we have not done terribly because at, at that baseline, we would have thought that if there were no lockdown, there would probably be about 2 million deaths and much less than a million if, if we had these lockdowns. And I think we've achieved that purpose. Second is that we've managed to delay these infections. And so we are learning a lot from other countries in terms of how to deal with the pandemic. So that's really helpful there. The third piece is that, uh, you know, that's all the good news. The bad news is we still have a long way to go. 100 million is only one fourteenth of our population. So there's a lot of people still at risk. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, this is going to be the way of life for a few months from here on. And there's, it's going to be this in and out lockdowns and, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, today the peaks are happening in Pune and Bangalore and Ahmedabad. Uh, three weeks ago, they were happening in Chennai, uh, Delhi and, and Mumbai. And it's not clear that those are over yet. So I think it's going to be this sort of cat and mouse game, not just for us, but throughout the world. Even countries that appear to have done very well so far, what are they going to do? They can't run away. They're going to have to deal with the virus as well. So this is a long game. And I think Jaspreet's book is a, is a good reminder that uh, this is sort of, uh, Jaspreet, you want to push that away if you have to say, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's a good reminder that, you know, there are lessons that we can learn at the time like this to figure yeah. out how to reorganize other parts of our life for a long-term benefit, you know, whether it be that we're driving less and so we're paying attention to climate change, even not directly, we're doing better on the environment. There's lots of positives about, uh, you know, the shutdown as, as many as there are obviously huge negatives as well. And uh, I, I think your, your, your thoughts here are really part of that positive process, which is why, uh, you know, yeah, well, how, how you make organizations anti-fragile is one of the things we're going to get out of just speak in a couple of minutes. But if I could just take you up, you know, take you up, on, because you said some things that I think everyone has suddenly sat up and said, hang on, what's that, you know, 100 million cases and, you know, the rest of it. So I just, I, I have to sort of just dive into that a little bit. Two or three points. I mean, you are correct when you're saying India is not testing that much on a per capita basis. We've done 12 million tests overall, so that's what I think third or fourth highest in the world. So per capita, it's low, but then per capita deaths and per capita cases also may therefore be low. But the bigger question that I want to ask you is, supposing what you're saying is correct, and there are actually 100 million coronavirus cases that are out there, it's not that easy to, to, to hide deaths because if there are lots and lots of deaths, it would show up somewhere, right? There'd be people in crematoriums and morgues, morgues would be getting, uh, get, getting clogged and things like that. So if there are 100 million cases, and let's say deaths are not 25,000, but 50,000 or 60,000, that potentially means that coronavirus is not as serious a disease as all of us have believed. Maybe these precautions aren't required. Maybe you don't need to have masks and social distancing and the rest of it. If there are 100 million coronavirus cases and only 50,000 deaths. I mean, that's a, that's a devil's, devil's advocate way of looking at things. Right. So two, two things. So uh, remember that there are two things that make up deaths. One is uh, the, this way, okay, closer, okay. Uh, I'm socially distanced. <laughs> so there are two things that make up deaths. One is uh, it is the sheer number of cases, right? So you don't care if the deaths per case are 0.1 or 0.5, uh, that alone. You also care about the total number of infections. The difference between the coronavirus and all the other infections we have to deal with is that this potentially goes to, you know, 800 million infections eventually, probably a billion. There is almost no disease that we have that infects 800 million people, Indians a year. There is none. Even influenza is probably in a max of about 150 million. So there's a cap on that and take HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS, all these are easily controlled because, you know, you don't have unprotected sex, you don't have you know, bad blood transfusions, you can keep a cap on it. Here it's an involuntary disease where the cap is really high. So the, the number of cases will grow to be very high. The second is that even if we had the same fatality rate as influenza, it would still be a large number because you're talking about five or six times that number, right? So that's the reason why COVID is an important issue. The second is that that entire number of deaths is happening not spread out over a period of time, but without any control. So let's say there had been no lockdown. We would have had a wave that was so huge that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't have handled it at all. So it's not just how it works over time. See, a million deaths in India is not a lot. Uh, I know it sounds scary to say that, but it's not. 
because we have 8 million deaths a year. You can have, you know, another 10% and you won't really notice it because we don't have the death reporting system to really pick it up. But you will notice it if that million deaths happens in the space of two months, then you will definitely notice it. And I think that's what creates the panic that creates the lines of the hospital and so forth, which is what I think we have averted. I, I would give India's performance, you know, pretty good grade. I know it's terrible, but let's all remember this is India. You know, we've got all of our challenges of density of population. The politicians are not always doing the right thing, et cetera, et cetera. But overall, it's not bad. It's better than what I had imagined. All right, that's, uh, that's an interest. I, I know we can continue to discuss this, and no doubt we will a little later. But I just want to turn now to to just speak on the book and you know how do you make an immune organization. So if, your basic thesis just wait, seems to be black swans are going to come. This is another black swan. But like you vaccinate yourself to prevent to protect yourself from unknown, you know, unknown unknowns. Um, that's what an organization should really do: make itself. I think anti-fragile is the word that you use. Uh, why don't you just take us through the basic basic thought process and then we'll dive into some of the antidotes. Okay, thank you very much, Vikram. And uh, great to hear that we are still doing well despite all the movement around us, uh, Ramanan. Uh, so black swans is, is actually, and I'm sure all of us have heard what black swans are. We know what they are. Uh, they, it, it was a term which was originated by uh, Nasim Taleb, and he basically defined black swan events as the unknown unknowns, events which were hugely disruptive as well as unpredictable. Now, actually, Taleb has gone on record and said that the, this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, is not a black swan. Because while it has been hugely disruptive, it has been predictable. It was predicted by people like uh, Professor uh, here, it was predicted by Bill Gates four or five years back in his famous TED talk, et cetera, et cetera. What I believe, however, and I write in my book, is that while the pandemic itself is not a black swan, is a gray swan or some other color of swan, the lockdowns have been a black swan. No one predicted the lockdowns as well as the disruptive power of the black dog, of the lockdowns. And so in the month one of the lockdown, as I was kind of looking around and uh, twiddling my thumbs, uh, one of the things which was obviously apparent was that there was this race for a vaccine for COVID. Everyone, there's this big race happening, you know, how we kind of get a vaccine out on record time. Now, vaccines, as you know, don't necessarily cure the disease. Vaccines are to prevent the disease from happening again. And the way they normally work is that you inoculate your, in simplistic terms, you inoculate your a human being with weakened or dead viruses or bacteria. And the, and the body doesn't know what it is and it kind of starts gearing up to produce some kind of antibodies. Uh, and because these bacteria or viruses are dead, you don't really fall sick, you fall a little sick. But the important thing is that next time when the disease comes, your body is ready the antibodies have been produced and therefore you become immune. And that's how immune systems work. And so the idea that I had, which kind of resulted in this book was that, look, why can't we learn from this pandemic, from COVID and start producing antibodies in our organizations and in our societies and in our lives so that next time a big disruption like this happens, we are far more ready, we are far more prepared, and therefore we and our organizations are immune. And that is why the immune organization as the title of the book. And then I kind of go and talk about the various, actually seven antibodies that we should be starting to produce now in our organization so that when an event like this happens again, we have immunized it to a large extent and are much more ready to face this a new black swan. That's the basic idea, uh, Vikram, behind the book. So if I could just load, I, and, I, and I get you to, to, to talk through some of the, of the many anti the antidotes that you have out here. But you're saying that the lockdown was the, was the black swan, and perhaps it was for certain industries, right? Like restaurants and travel and you no know, I mean, the impact has a retail, the impact has been massive and it's been very difficult, difficult to figure out how you're going to deal with it. Uh, would, but 
some of what you mentioned, which is also there as an antidote, is arguably things that every organization should have already been doing and already preparing and already vaccinating themselves with, such as the entire drive to digitization, the entire question that life is going to now move from being entirely bricks and mortars to being partly digital, to be able to have interactive sessions, that is, virtual sessions like this. I think that's a trend that was so predictable. It was been, it's been predictable for 10 to 15 years that this is going to come and it's going to be massive and we should be ready for it, right? The concept that you, you'll be, you'll be you know, working from home or video conferencing as opposed to having to meet in offices. So is that something which organizations should have seen and they didn't see? And some of the organizations that are doing the best right now are just those which have the obvious foresight to, to sort of, you know, See, it's obvious this is going to happen. It happened faster than we thought. It happened in a more aggressive manner than we thought. There was a specific event that led to it, but this was always going to happen. That's an interesting question, uh, Vikram. And actually, you know, if you kind of go back to Black Swans, uh, Taleb himself has written about seven or eight different Black Swans till now. You know, Brexit was one. 9-11 obviously was one. The 2008 financial crisis was another one. But the, and, and so those have been happening and therefore most good organizations across the world, you're right, actually have great contingency plans. They have playbooks, you know, when disruption happens, even an earthquake happens, what to do and, you know, there are these processes written down, etc. What, however, is different in this case is, is the scale, the absolute unpredictability uh, of when it ends and the fact that it is geography, it's global. There's no geography really, which has kind of been spared of it. And many of those playbooks actually talk about redundancy. You know, there'll be certain parts of the world which would not be affected and therefore you start acting from there, et cetera, et cetera. All of that has not been valid in this case. And so this, this particular disruption, this has been a tsunami and it's kind of been absolutely unprecedented. So having said that, what has happened, as you said, is that Many organizations have very quickly adjusted and, you know, uh, uh, working from home, for example, or learning from home, for example, very quickly moving on to in a matter of days, entire organizations were actually working from home or learning from home. They were not prepared for it. You know, there were huge bandwidth issues. There were policy issues. There were uh, equipment issues, infrastructure issues. They were not prepared for it, but because in a crisis, you've got to do something. And so they did it. And so you're right that many of these things were slowly happening. I mean, this, this work from home, what I call uh, in my book, it's actually the decentralization of work or the decentralization of education and actually decentralization of everything had been happening for a while. And it was predicted in, and it was called the future of work, for example. Digital business models were happening. You're right. I mean, people were gradually digitizing. Uh, many times kind of pushing it back because it involved investments, etc. But they were gradually doing that. And a bunch of other things they uh, were doing. But, but this crisis has become an accelerant. And so one of the things I write in the book is what I call the COVID paradox. You know, COVID has actually slowed down the world, but it has accelerated change at the same time. And so all of these things have gotten accelerated. The future of work has suddenly become now. And every business model now is looking to become as digital as possible. And, you know, the way you learn lifelong learning, for example, or there are about seven different, there are actually seven such antibodies, decentralization being one of them, cultural change being another. Many of them were slowly happening in summary, but this pulled it forward and hopefully we will learn from that. Uh, I think Vikram, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, I just unmuted myself. Uh, you would have thought that by now after a hundred days, you would have figured out how to unmute uh, when you were speaking. But, but you know, so, so you're right. I think a lot of these things are some of it were unknown unknowns that you they were could not have been anticipated, such as the lockdown path, to this extent and this severity. But many of the other things were trends that you perhaps people could have could, should have been able to see and are not. So 
President, let me just turn to you there and ask you, so that we're not sitting here two months from now and saying, oh, we should have, for example, been able to foresee this. Um, if what you're saying is correct and the cases are actually much higher than we think. I mean, right now, India is talking about 1 million cases. If it actually gets out that it's on 1 million cases and it's 100 million cases, there is going to be a wave of panic. Let's face it, right? You keep arguing that not that many people are dying, there'll be a wave of panic. In any case, if you see the acceleration that's happening, the growth rate has been 3.5% now for nearly 25 to 30 days, which means at that rate, the actual absolute cases are going to go on rising, and those are the reported cases that I'm talking about. Could there be another lockdown? Should there be another lockdown? Is that something we should all start preparing to? We've seen it in a couple of states already. Bihar is talking about it. Bangalore is talking about it. Another nationwide lockdown. Um, so, Vikram, uh, it's, it's, um, it's inevitable that the cases will actually continue to go up. So, uh, this, is, this is going to keep happening anyway. Um, the lockdown was an initial, it was an initial strategy to be able to postpone the, the, the wave of cases. And remember the lockdown came into place and, you know, when I had called for a lockdown, there were only a hundred cases and there had been 10 deaths and, and people thought that was just absolutely nuts. Why would you call for a, you know, lockdown based on that? But of course we could predict that this was going to happen today. But the purpose of the lockdown was just to postpone as well as to buy some time. That's all it could really do. Dra lockdowns in India are draconian. They're very harsh, but they're not very effective. They're not very effective because people don't have the luxury of social distancing. They don't have the ability to actually just stay away from each other in a physical sense. I mean, we can here, but most people can't. They're in spaces which, you know, they live in very close proximity to each other. So the lockdown is a very blunt instrument when you don't test enough. So when you don't test enough, I can't do a surgery on just this locality. I just shut the whole place down. It's actually a lockdown is not a great idea as a replacement for testing. And the fact that we're calling for lockdowns in particular places, not we, but you know, politicians are in places like Karnataka or West Bengal or whatever, you know, it happens to be happening today is because the testing is so inadequate that they don't actually know where the cluster of, of, of cases are. And when you don't know where the clusters are, then the lockdown becomes your only solution to try to see how you can control the mounting cases. But this is not the way to do it. The way to do it is really to have a steady state where everyone's wearing a mask, everyone is socially distancing, and uh, we're able to pick up the cases very quickly and isolate and contain in those places. That's really the long-term solution, but we have not really reached that point yet. So I think, you know, again, to use, uh, you know, sort of just Preet's book as sort of the example here, this is a situation where we really need that social vaccine and lockdowns are not the social vaccine. Lockdowns are a replacement for the social vaccine. The social vaccine is one where people all cooperate, do the right thing. And, uh, you know, there for many, very many things, we do things in our country out of ignorance and, and people in the US do it because, you know, I, I don't know, sometimes also ignorance, but we don't have the issues with people not wearing masks in our country because they just think, oh, I don't really want to wear a mask. It's, it's that, you know, that distancing is just hard in India. You know, social distancing is, is difficult. And because that will not happen, you will see lockdowns, but this is not the preferred method. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that many people who always believe that Indians have been, uh, are in general somewhat indisciplined. Uh, I have to say, when you consider the way the average Indian has responded, you know, by and large to coronavirus, that by and large you drive around in Delhi, over companies, you see people wearing masks, you're not having people clustering in bars or refusing to, you know, to, to do it. So to that extent, I think it's been good. Now, I think the point I'm going to ask you is that, so... The lockdown was required a to control the, the curve so that, that the medical systems PPE could be done, testing can be ramped up, hospital beds can be put into place, and the rest of it. A, a Delhi would be a, perhaps an example of a success story where because there was testing, the beds were put into place. Actually, most of the beds have not been required, and that's that, that's actually excellent news that the uh, active cases are actually going down. What is the advice, therefore, for other states now? Like if you're, if you're a Bihar or you're a, a Bangalore or a Karnataka or a Telangana, where now you're having suddenly cases going up, and perhaps some of these states do not have the sort of medical you know, facilities that have been built up. So do you, do you have to lock down now to say, okay, we better get some 
we should have by now built up testing and built up medical facilities. But if for some reason we haven't, what are we going to do now? Well, first of all, we have not. We've not actually, I mean, testing has increased a lot from in UP, for instance, has gone from 300 at the beginning to over 45,000 a day to day. So we've done, you know, reasonably in some of these places. But think of this as a cricket match where, you know, our top batsmen are Delhi, Mumbai, and Chennai. These are the places with the best medical facilities. And, you know, they didn't do that great. They also suffered a significant amount. And they've not done that well. So now you've got, you know, the worst batsmen sort of coming in. And then you've got a whole bunch of tailenders, whether it be, you know, Kolapur or, you know, Dibrugar or Patna or uh, apologies of any views from there. And you know, don't take it personally. But, you know, these are places that don't really have medical facilities. So you're taking cities with excellent medical facilities and we've really taken it on the chin here. Can you even begin to imagine for that hundred set of towns, whatever it might, it might even be a Kanpur or a, uh, you know, uh, it, it could be so many places, Bhopal, Gwalior, who knows how these, these places will actually fare. And let me tell you that the challenge is not about setting up beds. Beds are the easiest things to buy or oxygen is easy to buy. But the actual inoculation for this would have been investing in just the entire systems of of doctors, of nurses, of infection control, which we didn't do for 25 years. You can't buy all that. You can't train a critical care physician in two months. So either we had built these systems to make ourselves a resilient country, which is what investment in or anti-fragile country, uh, to make ourselves uh, you know, uh, ready for something like this, or we didn't, and we clearly did not. So, uh, so whatever can be done has been done, but that's only a limited part of what really needed to be done. All right, um, just wait, let me now, now let's come back to the organi organizational part of it and do take us through some of the other antidotes. Like what does it take to, to create an anti-fragile you know, uh, organization? So obviously lessons for the country, what, what should organizations be doing? Now? So uh, when um, uh, Taleb wrote the book on black swans, when everyone said, you know, that's easy. I mean, yeah, sure, there are unknown unknowns, black swans happen, so what's the big deal? Okay, what do we do? What, how do we kind of prevent or how do we kind of deal with black swans kind of events? Uh, the COVID pandemic being obviously on the lockdowns being one of them. And so then therefore he, the next book that he wrote, which I borrowed liberally from was called Anti-Fragility. And basically he said that, look, uh, there are three kinds of systems, systems which are fragile and they kind of break down if a disruption happens. Many of our organizations, our societies, in many cases, us, many times. Then most of us think that the opposite of fragile is actually resilient, which is in the face of disruption, it stands. And some of our organizations do, some of us do. But he said that the actual opposite of fragile is not resilient, it's anti-fragile. So an anti-fragile company or an organization or a society or an individual is one who actually gains from the disruption. And so taking that in, in, in mind, one of the things that I started trying to figure out was that what are the things we could do or an organization could do to learn and create those antibodies to make themselves not only resilient, but in certain cases, anti-fragile. So if you look at, for example, if you look at certain player, Zoom obviously comes to mind, so does Netflix or Amazon Live or some of the e-commerce players globally they have, act, or some of the pharmaceutical firms, they have actually gained from this disruption. They've kind of zoomed up, you know, pun not intended, but they've just zoomed up. And so they have actually been anti-fragile. They've actually used this. Now, if you kind of go and dissect as to what are the six or seven things that you can do uh, to make your, uh, make your organization resilient or anti-fragile, and so those seven antibodies that you need to produce, uh, they're the following, and I'll speak about three, four of them. The rest, I think everyone is going to be curious to buy the book so they can read it there. But the, the first one, and probably amongst the most important ones, is decentralization. One of the things that this uh, pandemic has shown us is that decentralized systems are far more resilient and sometimes anti-fragile than centralized systems or, or societies or organizations work, uh, work from home or work from anywhere is nothing but decentralized work. If you look at retail, for example, the big malls, etc. closed down, it's the decentralized Kiranas, which were 
which were you know, uh, uh, serving us. You look at hotels, the big hotels closed down, the smaller Airbnbs, which were decentralized or the smaller lodges are the ones which are actually going to become bigger uh, uh, once this uh, gets over. In fact, even the labor migration that we saw is nothing but the decentralization of labor because they used to centralize themselves in big cities and now they're kind of going back. And so maybe tomorrow factories will have to decentralize themselves. And so if you just think of decentralization as or the gig economy for that matter, decentralization of authority for that matter. So if you kind of look at decentralization itself, and if organizations were to start working on making their companies far more decentralized in every way, they would actually build a very, very powerful antibody to disruptions like this. Talib in fact says that the first rule of anti-fragility is decentralization. Because decentralized systems tend to get far less disrupted. They're spread out, you know, any time when any kind of disruption happens. So that's one. And I'll pick another one, which I think would be possibly, um, um, you know, interesting to most of us. And, and that, that's actually my sixth antibody in all of these. And, and, and that's about us as individuals, as professionals, or as workers, or as entrepreneurs. Uh, one of the things that this disruption has done, which we all know, is a colossal lack in jobs, lack of jobs, you know, with your companies closing down, people's uh, salaries being cut, people losing jobs, etc. And I think one of the things it's going to teach us, and it's another future of work principle, that one-time education is over. And what we need to do is actually lifelong learning. And so many of us will have to start developing skills beyond what we were just educated to do. Because that just taught us one narrow thing, and we kept on doing that, and you know it got disrupted, it gets disrupted. And so literally learn till you die. Learn something new every 18 months. I mean, Howard, for example, learning from this has started something called a 60-year MBA. So you kind of start doing it when you're 20, and every year you start you keep giving some money to Howard until 80. You learn. And so if you know a hundred things, again, think of it as decentralization again. You know, certain things, certain stuff gets disrupted, goes away, certain job goes away, you, you have something else. So this whole concept of I've done my engineering or whatever, I've done my MBA after that and after this for the next 40 years, now I need to earn, is going to go. People are going to do multiple jobs, not only one, uh, multiple, the, uh, multiple gigs. Organizations are going to change to allow them to do that. And you know, as one of the Lord of the Rings quote basically says that not all those who wander are lost, people are going to wander from one place to another. So these are two of the six or seven uh, of the seven antibodies. Digitization is another, new business models, new customer experiences, partnerships, changing culture. So there are about seven of them, but I thought I would just dwell on these two because they're probably the most interesting. No, I think that's, that, that's really fascinating. And I, if I could just ask you, you know, another question, because what, what are the reasons why some of these changes are particularly important? Again, this is a trend that anybody should have been able to see. And I'm going to take an example from epidemiology, and I'm going to get, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Rekhan, uh, also to, to speak about it. It's a question of the exponential curve, right? And the exponential curve, what happens is change happens. And happens faster, 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 and it keeps on going. And one of the obvious trends that is there in the world around us is that as change is coming, as new technologies are coming, the impact of those is going to accelerate faster and faster and faster. And it's got nothing to do with coronavirus. It was already going to happen. And one of the things that I have been somewhat struck by is that when you sometimes people tend to underestimate the pace of that change. So over the last few years, for example, when I quit TV news and I said, oh, I'm going to start something completely different, digital video news or whatever it is, and a lot of people say, no, no, this is going to take, this is not going to happen. It'll take 20 years for it to change. And this, this is what is the way things are done. And this is therefore the way things will always be done, or at least for another 10 years, this is the way things will be done. But sometimes we tend to underestimate the pace at which that change will come. Do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. And a lot of other much more eminent people also agree with both of us on that. Bill Gates talked about how, you know, you kind of, you underestimate technology for the next uh, 10 years, overestimate it for the next one year. And you can write about that for change itself. Absolutely. A lot of the things that 
all of the things that I have written about uh, are very obvious. There's nothing new, you know, in the sense that it's not that people did not see it coming. As I said, decentralized work was going to happen. We had gradually started decentralizing. Uh, lifelong learning, we were moving towards it. Uh, new business models with the uh, much more as digital as possible business models. Everyone was slowly, inexorably kind of doing that gradually. Um, creating a web of partners, making them internal to your business model, always happened. But, you know, if you talked about curves, most of these things happen in a smooth curve. And sure, one of these days you hit that hockey curve or that hockey stick. But until you hit that hockey stick, you're complacent. But many of these curves, uh, Vikram, sometimes tend to get hugely accelerated by very singular, very disruptive events, which break the curve right. and create a new curve. I mean, you think of the war, for example, the, the two wars. And the Second World War, actually, I mean, speaking from a technology viewpoint, gave rise to more technologies, more change than 30 years before that and maybe 20 years after. Or if just landing a person on the moon, another big disruptive event, you know, changed a whole lot of, uh, 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 you know, the whole space and everything around technology. So these events just tend to many times greatly accelerate in a disruptive manner, a uh, change which has already slowly uh, been happening. And, you know, that's why these crises, you can look at these crises in two ways. You know, you kind of look at these and you say, you know what, I'm just going to sit in my Now, how can I leverage it, this crisis? And Churchill, I think, famously said that never waste a good crisis. And this is another one which we do not need to waste, whether from a society viewpoint or an individual viewpoint, or as I write in my book, from an organizational viewpoint. Right. I'm about to throw it open to, 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 to questions from the floor and from people out there. But if I could just come to you, Prasakshan, one, one last question. Look, we're talking about curves. We're talking about mathematics and obviously modeling this epidemic is the single biggest question that is on everyone's mind. Now, I was speaking about exponential curves, but curves don't necessarily have to be exponential. They could also be logistic curves or S curves. And that basically means that some of the more scary numbers that we're talking about will not happen because the curve will go up and then it will flatten. It will flatten for reasons that we don't completely know or completely understand, but the curve will flatten. Now, if you look at coronavirus, I'm not saying this is the case. I'm just putting out a to me, for the sake of being provocative, I'm putting out a theory out there. Is it is it feasible that if you look at the way coronavirus has happened in country after country around the world, it's actually followed a logistic curve, not an exponential curve. It's risen, but then it has flattened. That happened in New York, it happened in Spain, it happened in France, it happened in the UK, it happened in Delhi, China. We can keep questioning whether the numbers are correct or not, but country after country saw that which means that even this virus is somewhat self-limiting. Is that a possibility or is it not a possibility that you think is, is going to happen? So mathematically, a logistic curve is just a cumulative exponential curve. So that's how it is. So whatever you see as a logistic is actually adding up, you add up the exponential and that's what you get as a logistic curve. So for those of you not familiar, a logistic yeah. curve is like an S-shaped curve. But at the part of the S-shaped curve, which are the steepest part, that's a that's an exponential increase. So it's basically doubling very very fast, and then it flattens out. Which and logistic curves are very common in nature. You know, uh, human populations follow this, or you know, bird populations follow this. And typically, the part where that logistic curve hits the top is what is called the carrying capacity, which is, you know, how many uh, how many people can potentially be infected by by a virus. The reason again why COVID is a is a problem is a concerning problem for us is because unlike even influenza uh, the 1918 influenza pandemic which killed lots of people you know 50 70 million people uh, when the population of the world was much smaller only infected 25 percent of the population okay we don't know why but a lot of it is also because 25 percent 
because it's a flu virus and we've all experienced a flu virus at some point in our life. So we have some innate immunity to influenza viruses. This particular coronavirus, we don't actually have any immunity at all. There's nobody with, uh, you know, who seems to have immunity prior to being exposed to the virus. So for this reason, this carrying capacity will happen at a very high play place. So the, the number will be high. When you talk about a billion Indians, that's, that's why we talk about things like herd immunity and so forth. It's not because I think of it as a strategy that we want to get there, but in its natural course, the infection will go to one of these very high points for a very simple reason that nobody, until they've experienced the virus, has immunity to the virus. In fact, there are questions about whether we have immunity even after we've been exposed to it and for how long, but let's set that aside for a second. That's what makes us completely novel, and this happens periodically with viruses which make the jump from animal that we have no experience with. And, you know, uh, I say this often, but viruses don't intend to kill us. They have no enmity with us, right? In fact, uh, a successful virus is a common cold virus. Why? It jumps from person to person, doesn't bother you at all. It's a very successful virus. And, you know, in the words of, you know, an obscure biologist who, you know, is famous as a biologist, you know, all disease is a result of misunderstanding between us and the virus. It's a misunderstanding because our body looks at this virus and says, oh my God, I've got to overreact. And these cytokine storms, which you also talk about in the book, this is most of what kills us is our own immune response to the virus because it can't figure out what to do with it. So it just floods, you know, our own body. And, you know, fever is an example of our own body sort of immune response. And because this virus is so new, the body has no recognition of it. It has it's never seen anything like that before. So long answer to say that, I mean, again, just to also say that normally as human beings, or unless you're studying this stuff, we don't have an experience with exponential growth. I mean, we, we don't observe exponential growth. We don't really know what it really looks like, but exponential growth to, you know, to a person studying technology is the simple idea that your cell phone in your pocket is about, you know, a thousand times more powerful than the computer that put the man on the moon. That, that's a mind-boggling thought, right? We actually sent missions to the moon with the amount of computing power, which is one thousandth of what's in your pocket right now. That is exponential technology growth. That's, you know, the number of teraflops that would have been increasing. And, you know, that, this is something that's widely written about. But since we don't experience it, that's why this number of cases increasing, all of this seems so scary to us. But this is pretty normal. That's just how it will happen. We'll have 100,000 cases a day at some point, but I don't think anyone should be worried. That's just how the virus works. Okay. I, I still think people are going to be somewhat worried. Uh, and no doubt some of those worried people have questions right now. So let me let me toss it back to you and, and see if there are some questions there in the lounge or anywhere else. Can I ask a question, uh, Vikram, if, if no one has one just yet or while we're waiting? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so I'd recommend all of you read the book. It's, it's really interesting because what, what Jaspreet has done is put together, you know, obviously these sort of longer term thoughts on things like future proof of work and, and, and uh, obviously work from home and so forth on into you know, the context of COVID, obviously with the example of, of the vaccine kind of an idea. But the one thing which I found sort of, I couldn't quite wrap my head around is this idea of when you have these examples of organizations that have adapted. I wonder if they have adapted because they were set up as resilient organizations or they just happen to be lucky. So today we're facing COVID, but imagine there's a completely different sort of white or black swan event, which was something which takes down the internet, the entire world. And for whatever reason, it can't bring it back up for, you know, a hundred days. What would happen to the Amazons and the Zooms of the world? Good question. Be an instance where a computer generated virus will have far more impact than a biological virus and we'll actually be doing social media distancing rather than show social distancing at that point of time uh, but uh, it's a good question and uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of research which is actually going to happen okay, to figure out some of these things some of these questions including this one that the organizations which survive were they set up to do that or you know, they were just, you know, it just happened right, right in the right place. And I think the answer, as most answers are, is a mix of uh, 
this particular disruption is a is the one which disrupted physical life, physical activity far more than many ways, right? And and so the companies which were digital by birth or had adopted and became became tech now tech or tech at core or digital and had adopted portions of the digital world in their business model uh, became more resilient because you know. And so yes, some of them were at the right place. But the key here is that it's not, you know, what is digital? I mean, what is technology or digital? I mean, we all know what technology is. Digital is not about technology. Digital is not about process. Digital is actually a state of mind. And that state of mind is about how you use technology to be far more agile. And many companies which have used technology well have basically become, have given themselves agility. And the companies which have been far more agile, have been therefore agile, more agile to respond to a disruption, any disruption, have therefore been more, more resilient. So there are organizations which tens of thousands of people, which actually, as an example, started working from home, all of them in 48 hours. There are organizations with the same number of people who couldn't do it in entire lockdown. Okay, similar business. But the only difference between the first and the second was that the culture of the first one was far more agile and a lot of that agility was driven by technology driven business models, technology driven processes, etc. And it was not a function of being at the right place. And so the answer really is a mix of both. But I think that I think that, that that's an interesting question, of course, because I mean theoretically the internet is to take your what you said just before decentralization. I've been thinking about it since since what Professor Dutton and I said, and I, I think I think you're right that it, internet is theoretically decentralized, so it should be able to survive a lot of what you provided. But who knows? Anything is possible. And you're right. You know, you can't you can't predict everything, and and sometimes sometimes these things are scary because. At, at, at Eritage, for example, at 6 p.m. we went home expecting that everyone is going to be back the next morning and no one had put in that office again for 100 days, you know, and that was, uh, it was uh, because it's digital, we were able to do it. But if the internet had gone down, I had no idea what we'd be doing. So I think it's a, it's a valid point. It depends yeah. on what the... Yeah, sorry, sorry, Victor. No, I missed that bit that he asked. And actually what you said is very true. The internet has been super resilient. When it was made, no one ever thought that it could even grow to one ten thousandth of this. Take myself an example here, uh, and and not collapse. But the internet has actually been super resilient. It has grown on the same architecture that it started out at. Very much the same. Nothing much has changed. And the reason it has been so resilient is what you say, Vikram, is because by its very nature. TCP IP or the internet or the protocol on which the internet is based is completely decentralized. No one owns the internet. And it's kind of decentralized and it's all across and it sits on everyone's computer. It also sits on data centers across the world. It sits on the so-called cloud. It sits on everyone's computer. It, it doesn't have a central place. It doesn't have central authority. It does not have a central control. It is amongst, it's probably the single most decentralized entity we have there and that entity has been by far the most resilient to every disruption. Right. All right, questions. Uh, Angar Chathwet, back, back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chandra. Thank you so much, uh, guys. Thank you for that insight. Into... Well, so let's begin with our question and answer. Hi, Mr. Bindra. Good evening, and thank you for discussing your thoughts. I'm going to ask you an urban question because I'm from urban India, and it affects my life urban way, you know. Now, you have given antibodies about, you know, a list of antibodies which we should do, organizations should do. Let me give you a live example. You know, I was entering this building today and I was sitting in my car cozily and they are going to spray some disinfectant outside my car, you know. Now, unless there are people over here who get high by kissing the body of the car, what are the antibodies that you have for dealing with this corporate stupidities that's happening because of COVID, you know? <laughs> it's on a lighter note. You know, 
many times they say that it's not a COVID uh, pandemic, it's actually a pandemic of stupidity. Uh, but I would argue actually that the pandemic of the stupidity pandemic was happening even pre COVID. Okay, it was not something which it, it, COVID only managed to highlight some of the stupid things that the human race was doing in many ways. And in some sense, probably COVID as a, is an antidote, not an antibody, but as an antidote to the stupidity that the human race was doing. So I, those are more philosophical answers. But look, my friend, there are a couple things. There are two kinds of, you know, uh, two kinds of uh, uh, antibody slash antidotes or reactions to uh, such a unprecedented, massive, unheard of, unseen, at least in this generation, disruption that we are facing now. There's stuff done which actually makes a difference. So masks make a difference and washing hands make a difference and social distancing makes a difference and that is not stupid. But then there are a few things which are done which are for symbolic value too. Okay, and so if the president of a country does not wear a mask, for example, symbolically many other people do not wear one. And you know, a lot of these things of spraying cars, uh, even the, uh, the apps that many of, in many countries are there, which presumably tell us that we are uh, safe, uh, are not really solving the problem. But sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, you need is from a symbolic viewpoint that look, stuff is happening. And it will be a mixture of stuff. I mean, some of the lockdowns, we spoke about the lockdowns, while the first lockdown, the big lockdown, was probably necessary for all the good reasons that uh, uh, Ramanan here outlined. Isolated, sudden lockdowns at whims and fancies of people are probably not, not the right kinds to do. So it's, it's always a mix of both, and some things will work, but we know. At least now, after 80 days, 90 days, we know what are the things that work. And I think all of us should focus on those and let our cars be sprayed by uh, liquid occasionally. All right. All right. So it is 7.30. Sorry. I was just about to say it's 7.30. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to be, 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 I mean, actually, I'm trying to figure out how many people here are actually remote and how many people are, are physically with each other. Maybe we could, we could, uh, I, I don't think those of us who are remote are actually going to get any drink or anything to, to continue the evening with, but I'm sure the others will. Um, Angad, do you want to keep this thing that it, it going now once uh, the remote people drop off, or how would you like to do it? It is 7.30. Uh, so, so the stream is still going on, so the remote people are still logged on. Uh, I, I, we have a few questions from uh, the people who've tuned in online for you as well. So if we, let's just let's field one more question from uh, from the people here, and then we can move to a few questions from our viewers online, and we'll wrap it up then. Is that okay, sir? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Let's just. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, I've got two questions uh, for Mr. Bindra. One for Mr. Bindra, one for the professor. And uh, brief questions. Mr. Bindra, where do you think India is going to be placed at the end of this crisis? Uh, how are we going to be doing as compared to the Western world? And uh, to the professor, do you think this is a manufactured virus? Yes, sir, your question is far more interesting, by the way. You know, every day of the week, there's some virus that would love to jump to humans. Why? Because, you know, they see us as like a all-you-can-eat buffet. I mean, every virus is trying to jump to somewhere else because it's just trying to survive and thrive. So we see these all the time, and it's uh, we can't rule the virus being man out being manufac uh, manufactured, but keep in mind that these viruses happen all the time. We have viruses like this in our country that come up. There's something called, you know, the Kyasanur forest disease. How many of you know, have ever heard of it? So that's something which is, you know, entirely from within our country. Zika comes out of a forest in Nigeria and in, in Uganda. So these are happening all the time, but we are not generally aware of it because it's not what we really pay attention to. But remember, there's a whole cluster of us who think about only these issues all the time. So we have committees, we have meetings, we run around the world all thinking about new, new viruses every day for every year for the last 25 years and every morning outbreaks of potential new viruses around the world it's happening all the time once in a while virus gets to be very lucky it gets to you know 
spread very quickly, not kill too many people, and be quite successful. And it does that. So nature is perfectly capable of creating this. Uh, the Chinese perhaps could have, but you know, there's no way to know really. And how will India emerge out of this? Um, I, I presume you mean it more economically because there are many facets to that uh, that question. Much like the thesis in my book, uh, the immune organization, where we have a choice. In that case, organizations have a choice to either not learn anything from this big crisis or disruption or to learn and build antibodies for future crises. So in India itself as a country, we also will have that choice. And if I was an optimist, I would say that, look, therefore we will hopefully learn a few things, learn one that, uh, and I'm sure the professor would agree with me, that a very insignificant percentage of our GDP actually goes to healthcare and our healthcare system needs big time building up. Hopefully we will learn that the environment is far more important than what we uh, thought about and probably more important than our sometimes manufactured rates of growth. And so we should focus on that. Or perhaps uh, uh, we would uh, learn that we need more data and we need more science because it's only data and science which would kind of, uh, you know, which are the only two weapons uh, uh, that we have. Uh, or perhaps learn that, you know, uh, we also need to decentralize our decision making in the country. In fact, while I write so much about decentralization in my book and how it is the biggest antibody or antidote towards a disruption like this, unfortunately, most, mostly in our country, it has been the reverse. Stuff has become more and more and more centralized. And that doesn't work. So we could, and there are plenty more things which we can learn. And so if we learn those, uh, we can be pretty sure that we will come out of this better than a few other countries. And more importantly, when the next big one strikes, and we know that global warming related stuff is going to probably make this look like a, you know, a child, child in the park kind of a situation, uh, then it's good. But if we don't, then I think, I personally think that India will come out of this far worse than many other countries in the world. All right, let's, uh, let's shift to some of our online viewers. We have a lot of questions. Actually, the professor answered almost half of them by busting the myth that it's not a, uh, a manufactured virus because most of it was that. But uh, I do have a question. This is from Vivek, uh, who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, he's our founder and CEO. Ironically, lockdown in Goa. Uh, so this is for Jaspreet. You spoke about acceleration, but changing fundamental consumer behavior is something else. In your opinion, is it often inaccurate to extrapolate current biases into, current, into structural medium-term trends? Do we tend to overshoot? This is what Vivek asks you, sir. Okay. Uh, look, I think one of the most interesting things that's going to happen uh, from a business consumer viewpoint from this epidemic is how our habits will change. So, you know, different researches in different parts of the world uh, say that humans can develop a new habit of doing something rapid by doing something repetitively between 22 to 66 days. So th that's the kind of range that you have to either completely develop a completely new habit or to lose a habit that you had. And our lockdowns have certainly been more than that now. And so what has happened to all of us, consciously or unconsciously, we have developed many new habits, habits related to how we eat, how we play, going out, uh, just hygiene, uh, meeting people, uh, holidays, travel, everything. And because of that, consumer behavior And therefore, consumer journeys will change. Really, to how a customer thinks of buying something, buys it, uses it, throws it away eventually, etc. Those journeys change. And actually, the organizations, and this is actually my third antibody in the book, uh, organizations which use technology to be agile enough to change what they offer based on new customers. the ones 
you know, uh, uh, the entire restaurant uh, experience will need to very quickly change. You know, you'll need to start developing apps which allow you to book specific tables which are socially distanced, for example, to come in at a specific time, to not, uh, to have the menu right now immediately delivered, etc., to you on the phone itself. And so, companies which can do that fast, as a, a restaurants which can do that faster than the others, uh, you know, will, um, will change. Uh, restaurants, keeping to restaurants, for example, now will have to start rethinking themselves from being just restaurants where people come to being a combination of a small restaurant and a large amount of food being delivered to the rest of the people. So the business model is going to be different. Events, events like this, I mean, we are sitting in an event which is not equally adapted and said that, look, events become hybrid. They're not totally online, but they're not totally offline either. And the agility, therefore, because, because our by force, uh, our habits change and therefore our journeys change. Uh, thank you so much. Right. Uh, I mean, have you just... Vikram, you just, I think, wanted to we, say something. Vikram, I mean, we just wrap this up. We have a few questions for you while... Uh, um, together and we can wrap it up with this one last question. I mean, basically, how is the how is the entire situation impacted journalism? There's a question on uh, broadcasting. I mean, there's one that is tied up with uh, sport broadcasting and in general reporting of news because journalists need to be on the ground. So, I mean, what what's it been like for your industry? Like, we've heard a lot about uh, everything else. Well, you know, I. <laughs> I don't think I can afford to complain right now, as many of you have, may have heard the news. We just, you know, closed uh, uh, closed, an, closed an acquisition. I mean, it has been acquired, uh, you know, 51% stake by the, uh, the Sanjeev Guinka Group last week. So uh, I have, I mean, obviously, I'm not in the position where I can be complaining right now. To, to, to uh, the lockdown has been there, but I think for many people, and this is, this, this leverages what I was saying a little earlier in the day. A lot of these were trends that, that I think you could see coming. Journalism, the way it used to be, John, the fact that there would be print, the fact that there would be television news, the issues around TV news, the fact you've got to chase TRPs, the fact that the only way you seem to be getting audiences and TRPs and advertising is by yelling and screaming at people. You know, th so that's what the no was. And I think uh, many people were hoping that new answers will come, new ways of doing things will come. Can you give people personalized news or personalized playlists of information or whatever it is? So there were new ideas that were starting to emerge that we know that the traditional way of doing journalism or broadcast journalism or everything was starting to starting to fall apart. We had fake news coming in everywhere. Good quality producers were not getting uh, get, getting get, getting the right audiences uh, and. You were, you were having distribution on social media, which wasn't authenticated. So it was a broken model. And we were not very sure how long it would take for correct models to come in. Um, I think this has helped accelerate that trend. And I think people, when they're willing to look at new ways of doing things, will suddenly say, if I'm willing to change a new way of working, if I'm willing to have a new way of interacting with my family, if I can have a Zoom party with my friends every Saturday evening, why can't I have a different way of consuming news and consuming content. So that's an opportunity. And for those who are to do something different as to what the future would be, of course, is the, 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 I mean, you, you, it's, it's a, it's a, like a, like a, like a, actually, so there you are. Quick marketing, thank you, thank quick plug. Uh, thank you so much, Vikram, for moderating the conversation today. And I'd like to uh, thank, obviously, Mr. Binza and Professor Lakshminarayan for being here. And uh, thank you, everyone uh, who's who've come in today. I mean, apart from uh, it's this negative psychology that we need to fight, like you guys discussed, and this this helps it helps us get going. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.